EFF has started the build-up to the party's 10th anniversary later this month. Earlier in the week, party leader Julius Malema held a briefing at Uncle Tom's Community Centre in Soweto. Malema touched on a range of issues, including the Palapala Pala report, the state of youth politics in the country, as well as, uh, you know, he's urged Zimbabweans to go back home in order to vote in the elections next month in that country. Let's try to distill all of these thoughts for you, at least as much as we can. Bring in EFF spokesperson Snao Tambo, who joins us now via our video link. Snao, great to see you. Thanks very much indeed for making time as always for Newsroom Africa. And we are spoiled for choice about where to start in reflecting on this particular briefing and perhaps providing clarity. Let's start with that call urging donors to essentially reduce whatever money they give to the EFF to below 100,000 rand in an effort to ensure that um, the EFF is not essentially compiled to publish these donors. Part of the rationale we're told is that, you know, some of these donors are being targeted specifically because they support the EFF. But there are people who are confused by this because it is the same party that was in support of the Political Party Funding Act. It seems now that you may be undermining the act or the piece of legislation that you supported by exploiting its weaknesses? There is absolutely no measure of undermining uh, that piece of legislation. So if you listen to the broader context of the press briefing, which was led by the Commander-in-Chief and President of the EFF, he contextualizes this phenomena in the following way, that there's a lot of splinter parties being created in South Africa, which are smaller, and uh, all of them represent the same interests, which are the interests of the Oppenheimers, and all of them are funded by the same people. But the call for publicizing of political party funding came at the moment when they could see that the economic freedom fighters is able to sustain itself without broader support from the Oppenheimer establishment or international or domestic capital, because the EFF doesn't get support from the likes of people who go around bragging to be sponsoring all of those smaller splinter political parties and forming some sort of moonshot pact. We're a self-sustaining organization. So the legislation itself was created in a means to target and identify the funders of the EFF. But as an organization that believes in transparency, we were never going to stand against such legislation, but we must be able to put it to the fore that it was created to target us. So we are calling on our people and uh, those in the business sector, those uh, who want to support and finance the revolution, to continue to do so in all of the ways that they are doing. And if they have a disinterest of being targeted by the establishment, because the tender system in South Africa operates in such a way where you can be isolated if you are identified to support any certain political party. So business is anxious to support the EFF. So we've given them an avenue to ease their anxiety, and that is to donate to us to an amount where they don't have to expose themselves to the tyranny and uh, blackmailing tactics of an establishment that will victimize them for supporting the revolution of the EFF. So that's all we're saying. If you don't want to be victimized by the state and want to continue to be able to do business in South Africa while supporting the EFF, there's a method. You can SMS a donation. You can donate to us online. Sure. And uh, if you're so scared of being seen, uh, you can donate beyond that, below that threshold. There's nothing wrong with that. So now I'm terribly sorry to do this, but I'm sure you'll agree with my next decision. Musa Mota, who has been flying the South African flag very high in the UK, is back in South Africa and he's speaking to the media. But let's resume our discussion now with the EFF spokesperson, Sanao Tambo, as the party gathers up momentum in the lead up to its 10th uh, anniversary later on this year, of this month, I beg your pardon. Sanao, thanks for your time and indulgence. I'm sure you'll agree that it's important for us to shine a spotlight on the many right things that South Africans are doing, even beyond our borders. But we're still unpacking the rationale behind essentially calling for your donors, the owners of the EFF, to donate less than 100,000 rand. And part of what you've said is that the party believes the Political uh, Party Funding Act was put together in a way to try to single out the EFF. What's your response to people who believe that, you know, Transparency is actually the bedrock of any functional democracy, and this particular call, in some ways, undermines that. Look, I don't think we would agree with that, because, uh, of course, we supported the legislation because we do believe in transparency, but right. that doesn't mean that there are nefarious motives behind the legislation itself, and that's what we're bringing to the fore. That legislation was passed almost 20 years after our democracy, where was the cause for transparency before the formation of the EFF about who's funding who? So the critical thing that we must know is that there was an interest now in who's funding political parties because the EFF was exhibiting a rapid rise and growth and sustainability without any financing or any contributions from dominant capital which sustains the political terrain of South Africa. The African National Congress, the Democratic Alliance, Action SA, and all of these other splinter parties that are being formed to create a, some sort of mirage 
that there's multi-party democracy in South Africa in the form of many political parties, are all funded by the same individuals. They all have the same funders. And those funders were curious as to who's sustaining the EFF because we have not accepted their money. They don't want to fund us because we stand for ideals and policy positions that are at odds with sustaining the strength of white monopoly capital in South Africa. So we are saying that those who do want to associate with the EFF, when the, who want to avoid the level of victimization, which was the nefarious logic behind the establishment of the legislation itself, it wasn't established for good intents and purposes, are able to donate to the EFF without uh, exposing themselves to whatever they fear the state will do, which of course organizes itself to eliminate and undermine any prospects of sustainability of opposition parties. So that's what we're doing. We're not undermining legislation, we're protecting those who want to be able to sustain the revolution of the EFF without being victimized. I mean, at which stage does the EFF make this realization that there's some kind of nefarious intention? Because as you mentioned, this is a piece of legislation that was supported by the party in parliament. Yes, we did support it, but we supported it because we know that it can be used for good intents and purposes to ensure that uh, the political strata of South Africa is not captured by any individual. It's important. We understand its importance, and that's why we supported it. But we must also be able to make a political assessment. So just because we agree with something, just because we agree with a piece of legislation, doesn't mean that we can't make an analysis as to what gave birth to it. Why did it come to fruition? And that is what we're doing now. We're doing a political analysis as to why a certain piece of legislation came to pass. Yeah. It may be good, but why did it come? What does that analysis tell you about ways through which you should respond to people who want to support the, the EFF, but also want to know who supports the party, I mean, who funds the party? Look, it's a delicate balance. They'll have to be able to accept that uh, we'll disclose those who uh, reach the threshold that is required for disclosures of who finances political parties, which we do every time we are required. We are compliant with that in, that in terms of what needs to happen. But those who want to fund the EFF and don't want to expose themselves to what may be victimization must also be respected. So we must be able to respect that there are those who want uh, political transparency regarding uh, the financial affairs of the political strata in South Africa. And those who still want, there are those who still want to make contributions to the EFF, but remain uh, with some level of uh, uh, independence and ability to operate wherever they need to operate without being bullied. And that's what we need to be able to do. So there must be a delicate balance between those who want the transparency of whom we are part of and those who also want to be able to practice their democratic rights to financially support an organization that no one wants to support. Dominant capital doesn't want the EFF. So uh, we're not going to discourage people from donating to us, but also wanting to be able to protect themselves. Hmm. I'm sure you'll agree that the current situation is, is not necessarily sustainable, right? This idea that people have to essentially break down the amount of money that they want to give to the party so they can be protected from whoever's trying to target the organization. The obvious question is, what happens in the long term, right? Unless this is like the long-term plan from the EFF. Look, we don't have any long-term plan around what we're going to do regarding legislation around donorship. Uh, we're well, we welcome to the passing of the Act, and uh, we're part and parcel of being transparent and complying with it. And uh, as the democratic project in South Africa goes, we're going to, of course, be part and parcel of exploring ways as to how to manage transparency, how to manage the sustainability of political parties through donorship methods, and how we can ensure that those who want to, to donate to political parties are not victimized. So the political climate in South Africa is one where, unfortunately, there are those fears that uh, people can't donate without having uh, their interests in the business or private sector undermined by those who utilize the state power they have now to dominate the political and economic terrain. So we don't have any long-term plans in that regard, but of course it's a development, it's a developing democracy, and of course there'll be development, interact, developing interactions regarding the relationship between capital and uh, political parties in yeah. South Africa. Yeah, speaking about things that are developing, uh, the leader of the EFF had choice words for some other leaders within the organization who he reckons didn't do enough to ensure that enough people attend that rally that's taking place later on this month marking the 10th anniversary of the Red Berets. Um, <laughs> part of what he said is that those who don't meet, you know, the requirements from inside the party are simply not welcomed there. I wonder if that's something that's keeping you up at night. <laughs> no, not at all. So uh, the Commander-in-Chief is correct that the Economic Freedom Fight has issued a directive on the 31st of January that all public representatives and members of the Central Command Team and War Council of the EFF, councillors, members of parliament, members of legislatures, must make sure that they bring their constituencies 
the 10th anniversary rally of the Economic Freedom Fighters. And the, the deadline, the final deadline for that was the 30th of June. And it is an effort for us to show that those who are leading the EFF come from constituencies they represent and they're able to bring them to this great Red Festival of the Poor. And uh, so those who have not complied with that uh, directive uh, have, will be effectively banished from attending the 10th anniversary rally of the EFF because they have not only undercut the directives of the organization, but they have failed to show that they're actually leading people where they come from who have an interest in attending this rally of the EFF. And that is as simple as that. And uh, the organization is aware and capable and welcoming of the utterances of the President and Commander-in-Chief because there must be consequence management for people who don't comply with organizational directives. And uh, as the President had alluded to, we will be publishing the names of all of those who are not compliant with the directives given by the EFF uh, of selling a gala dinner table, of bringing the necessary transportation of their constituencies to FNB. And that is that. And no one is going to be kept up at night or struggling to sleep with something that they've known about since January. Sure. The Red Berets, or at least uh, Julius Malema's words, directed the idea that, you know, you take great exception to the Palapala report and its findings. I wonder whether you'll be taking any further steps to challenge that report from the acting public protector. Absolutely. We are going to explore the legislative measures that we can undertake to challenge the, the report by uh, the acting public protector. We believe it's nonsensical. It's not worth the paper it is written on because uh, it's at odds with everything that even Ramaphosa himself has said, when she has said that he runs a, a business, is uh, also known to be the sole director of Mkabanyoni, which controls Palapala Farm. So the argument that there's no conflict of interest between his executive duties or executive functions and him running a private business to generate profit for himself is uh, baseless, and we uh, made sure that we've exposed that to the people of South Africa, that we must all reject the ambitious pub acting public protector's report, because it seems to be a way for her to secure the post that she so dearly wants by absolving Ramaphosa for something that is so clearly guilty of. All right, so now Tambo is the spokesperson of the EFF. Once again, now thanks for your time and patience. Appreciate it here on Newsroom Africa.